Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Melrose Highlands Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here today and we are so glad to have you here. As an open and affirming church of the United Church of Christ, we welcome all inclusive of class, culture, race, ability, gender, and sexual orientation. You, you, yes you, all of you, are welcome here. There is no part of you that you need to leave outside of the doors of this church. So we are glad that you are here today. And happy Easter. We continue to celebrate Easter in this second Sunday of Easter in Eastertide. My name is Pastor Chris, and I want to give a special welcome to anyone who is new here today. Uh, if you are new, if this is your first Sunday here, then I am also new and I'm still getting to know everyone. Uh, and I would invite you to fill out one of these cards that are in your pew pockets. These will give us uh, contact information for you so that we can reach out and thank you for worshiping with us today uh, and also let you know what's happening in the life of Melrose Highlands Congregational Church. Uh, so please fill these out. You can put these in the offering baskets uh, as you leave today. Uh, and also, um, if you have been around forever and uh, your email address has changed, your phone number has changed, uh, feel free to fill these out as well and let us know of that change and we'll update our records and make sure uh, that we get you the information about, uh, about what's happening here. Um, also, if you are, uh, would like to become a member, uh, we are going to be holding classes, uh, a class soon about how what membership looks like here and what it looks like to be uh, a member of this church. Uh, and uh, I would be joining as well. I'll be joining this congregation uh, with anyone who is, uh, was, is also new. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, we will be scheduling that shortly and getting that information out via email. Uh, and you can come and talk to me about it if you are interested. Um, and then yesterday we had Beer and Bites, uh, and I want to thank everyone who uh, put that together, everyone who was there, everyone who was serving and welcoming people, everyone who was moving ice from place to place. Uh, such a wonderful event. Um, and specifically, I want to uh, have a thank you for Ann Moore, uh, I don't think that she's here today taking a well-deserved break, I am sure. But thank you, Anne, uh, if you were watching online. Uh, I have seen a lot of, or been to a lot of church fundraisers. And this was definitely like next level for that. So uh, fantastic job, everyone. I'm so excited for, uh, for the work that was in that and what that represents um, for the life of the church in, uh, in our budget and our ability to provide for, uh, for our mission partners as well, and specifically Bread of Life. Um, just a wonderful job, everyone. Um, just fantastic. Uh, also, I want to make sure to invite you to Bible study. Uh, if you're interested in doing Bible study, you can join us uh, on Zoom on Tuesdays at noontime. So we meet during the lunch hour. The idea is that if you're uh, someone who's working and can get away for that hour on Tuesday, you can come join us. Everyone is welcome to that. What we'll be doing for the next month is reading through the lectionary passages. So we'll be reading through the texts uh, that I'll be preaching on on Sunday and that we'll be forming our worship around. And so if you're excited about um, seeing those in advance and having a conversation, please join us for that. Um, and we'll get the, uh, the link out to that via email. Uh, if you're interested in joining us on Tuesday, um, please, uh, you can come talk to me. I'll make sure you get an email about it if you're not receiving that information already. Uh, and then uh, a final announcement for me, I'm not sure if there's any others, but uh, I know when I first came here, everybody was kind of, there were a couple of people were really excited about um, church bingo. And I think that you all didn't end up doing that because you were worried about freaking me out. Um, but I'm excited about this. There are uh, bingo cards for you if you're interested in doing bingo for Communion Sunday. Um, they, are, uh, they are back there. I believe the ushers have those. Um, and if you, get, uh, if you get five in a row, then when you do that, feel free to shout out amen. And that'll be like a response. Everyone else can shout out amen as well. So let's try that. Amen. 
All right, so if you hear that, even in the middle of the sermon or communion, really, I want you to do that. Shout it out nice and loud. Shout out amen. Everybody will shout out amen back, and then we'll just keep going. So uh, don't worry about how that's going to how that's going to be. I'm excited for that moment because uh, the spirit always can break into worship. So um, feel free to participate. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Oh, yes. I forgot about Val was reminding me that there are surprises as well. If you do get uh, bingo, then uh, there are two things that you get from that. You can come join me up here for, um, for the benediction. Uh, and when we do the benediction, you can process out with, uh, with the choir and the liturgist and I. Uh, and also there are prizes that Val has. Um, I'm not sure what those are, but I'm excited to see that. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? Right here. Hey, good morning. I'm John O'Terry. I'm from Service and Outreach. And I just wanted to invite the congregation into our next endeavor. As you remember, I think I was up here. Uh, in the winter about our mission work with um, teens in need and uh, donations that we put towards uh, Malden High School. Um, now I'm up here about our birthday wishes organization. This is a great group that we help support. They've provided birthday parties for over 100,000 kids in the last 22 years in Massachusetts. These are kids that are in um, shelters and hotels, uh, don't have a home, uh, birthdays, as we know, are very important um, for our kids, uh, even for adults. We know it. We have a big birthday celebration here at MHCC. Uh, so in your bulletin, there is a write-up on the birthday in a box collection. We collect two ways. We collect birth... Keep popping. Hold on. We collect birthday supplies, um, you know, from paper and um, hats and noisemakers. Uh, to birthday cake ingredients. Um, you can buy one or the other or both. Um, we are trying to build 30 boxes, 30 birthday boxes. We'll be assembling them at the end of the month, April 28th. Um, but please go to your bulletin. There's a QR code there. You can use Sign Up Genius. Uh, we really look forward to providing these boxes for everybody. Uh, our church has always come through on it. And I expect this year to be no different. Um, it's what one of the ways in which makes MHCC so special is that we do answer the call to help those who are in need. So uh, if you have any questions, please see me or anybody else in the service and outreach team. Uh, Kate Fazio is just coming in, myself, uh, my wife, Christine. Um, please, uh, we look forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Good morning. Our opening song is printed as an insert in our bulletin, Morning Has Broken. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. For the singing, praise for the morning, praise for the springing, fresh from the word. Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit as we gather ourselves to worship. God of the resurrection, we gather this morning as a community of believers. We come with joy to greet one another and to tell again and again the amazing news. Christ is risen. Love is victorious over death. You have given us new life in Christ's spirit. Let our singing, praying, and proclaiming be a testimony. A testimony to the power of your love, making us a new creation as a community of faith. Our first hymn is number 291 in the New Century Hymnal. 
The three in one, the creator of earth and moon and sun. You have loved and protected us since time first begun. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love, in God's love. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love. For the earth is our mother, where all things grow. And her valleys are green, where the waters flow. Gentle deer and the eagle and the mighty buffalo. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love, in God's love. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love. We are one in the spirit, in the great mystery, joined together in beauty as we dwell in harmony, bringing all of God's children into one community. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love, in God's love. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love. God, we ask you for leaders with your wisdom blessed. And we pray you will join us in our vision quest. God, we welcome you into our hearts as our guest. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love, in God's love. And we're brothers and sisters in God's love. When Jesus' friends asked him how to pray, he shared with them these words that we might always have a way to connect with the one who made us. Please join me now in praying to our Creator, our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, we come celebrating our unity, but we confess the many ways that we are divided. The richness of our diversity in nationality, ethnic origin, economic status, gender, age, sexual orientation, or denomination, all too often become a dividing line that obscures a common calling we share in Christ. May our common identity as your children and our communal witness to Christ bind us together in your name Forgive our tendency towards separation and division and remind us that we are your Easter people.
When we walk in the light of Christ, we have fellowship with one another. When we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just forgives all and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. For in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has show showered mercy upon everyone to the ends of the world. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Paul. 
All right. Will the children come forward? It's children's time. How are y'all doing this morning? All right? Yeah? Okay, good. Well, it's good to see you this morning. I see you're already working on the, uh, the bingo thing. You know what I realized during the, the song as the choir was singing? Often when the choir is done singing, I feel like saying amen. But I was really worried that if I said amen, I was going to get this wave of amens back, and everyone would have thought that I got bingo. So I didn't say it. So I've got to fix that one. Um, so what did you hear this morning in the scripture? Yeah. yeah, they were talking about the possessions and things that they had, and what did they do with those possessions? They shared them, right? Yeah, they brought them together, and then anytime somebody had need, they would find a way to distribute that so that everyone's needs were taken care of, right? you hear anything else in the passage this morning? It's a short passage, right? It's like, that's what you got. You got the, the, the basic thing, right? They, they, uh, they came together, and the disciples uh, and all of the followers of Jesus came together after Jesus died and after the resurrection, and they lived together in a community, and they shared with one another so that nobody needed anything in that community. Now, here's something that's really exciting about this. And this is one reason why we're talking about this the Sunday after Easter. This is their response to the resurrection, right? So Jesus dies, right? He's killed on the cross, and they put him in a tomb, and they go to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, last Sunday, and the stone is rolled away, and Jesus is resurrected. They, they, they speak with the, the risen Christ, and then... Jesus, after that, goes away. He ascends to be with God and is going to leave them with the Holy Spirit. He tells them to look for the Holy Spirit that's coming. And what do they do? They get together and they form a community and they share with one another so that nobody needs anything in that community and everyone is taken care of. Because they learned from Jesus that they were to love one another and to care about one another and they knew that Jesus cared about them and shared so much with them. And so when Jesus is alive again, when there's this new life, there's this new life in them too. And they decide to get together and do this and to care for one another and to provide for everybody. So we talk about church that like belief is kind of important, like what we believe and also what we do is really important. And here's a time when it comes together. They all do something really important together, which is to care for one another. And that's one reason why when we do all these things for one another, when we take care of, for instance, bread of life, when we serve a meal to someone who's hungry, and we raise money to do that, or when we make birthday boxes for people who are homeless so that they can celebrate their birthday in the situation that they're in, and when we provide for people's needs, we're doing that not because that's just a good thing to do around the edges. We're doing that because that goes back to the very roots of our faith, that, that there's new life in Jesus, and that new life provides for everyone. And so we do that. That's part of what we do. That's part of how we believe, right? That's part of who we are. So I wanted to share with, with that, that with you today. And... Uh, Let's pray, and then we can go back to our seats. Gracious, loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for new life, and thank you for the ability to do good things for one another, to provide for each other, to share with one another, and to welcome everyone in. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, amen. You can go back. I'm excited to hear amens from, from you all if you get there. And... Uh, and now, at this moment, we have uh, the passing of the peace. I'd invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another, pass the sign of peace uh, together. Peace of Christ for you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you this morning.
night. One day, I was reading the news, and I ran into this article about how the pyramids were built. It was kind of a clickbaity title that started with the word solved, with an exclamation point. It's part of our common understanding, right, that we've never been able to quite figure out exactly how the ancient Egyptians were able to build these gigantic stone monuments. And it fascinates me that we're still trying to sort this out so many years later. They were built over 4,000 years ago. And of course, this was done with no modern machinery, no diggers or loaders, as my son would point out. Um, like we're used to seeing on construction sites, no cranes or trucks. How did these giant stones get moved and stacked? It captures our imagination, right? We're not quite sure. So we even doubt that people could have done this at all. If there's those theories about how the pyramids must have been built by aliens, right? It's the plot of several movies that the aliens built the pyramids because they're just so massive and they invite us to ask how. How did this happen? How did this come together? And so the article I saw suggested that the ancient Egyptians were able to move the large stones by dragging them through the desert with a large group of laborers and a sled, and that the big secret was that they wet the sand in front of the stones. And they found a wall painting that depicted someone pouring a jug in front of the sled. And that's the picture of, uh, on the front of our bulletin this morning. So you can see what that looks like. And at first, archaeologists, when they saw this painting, they thought this might be some kind of blessing ceremony. Um, but then they realized that pouring water in front of the moving stones would have a practical reason, that doing this would create a surface that each stone could be dragged through, that the water would keep the sand clumped together so that it wouldn't bunch up and stop the sled from moving. And then the water would also provide lubrication so that the sled and the stone would slide over the top of the desert. The article that I read presented this as if this were this, this as if this were what solved the riddle of the pyramids, right? They used water, case closed, done. That's how it is. This seemed funny to me because with because with some thought, it didn't really seem to answer the question at all about how the pyramids were built. Right? Amen. All right. Pyramids were built. I'm I'm surprised that that was on the we, too, we didn't coordinate that. I'm, I'm curious as to what that last word was. So, uh, so, the, the, uh, so this brought up so many more questions, right, that the author didn't anticipate and didn't try to answer. So they used a gigantic amount of water to move these stones. They must have. It must have been a tremendous amount of water. They're moving them through the desert. Where did all that water come from? How did they bring all of that water there and then using this method how difficult was it to move the stones the great pyramid had blocks that weighed an average of 2.5 tons which is about the same weight as a large suv like a suburban or like a ford explorer right only the stone blocks don't have any wheels they've just got this sled and then the large blocks on the bottom they weighed much much more than that it was estimated these way uh, 15 to even 80 tons per block. And then the painting here where they show this person pouring water in the front, it also has at least, by my count, 60 people pulling the sled, and then there's many others who are doing things in this giant caravan of laborers who are needed to move this one stone. The pyramids were massive work projects, and one estimate, uh, one estimate is that it would, it would have taken 10,000 laborers 30 years to build one of the pyramids. What does that say about the culture that forced thousands of people into hard labor for years and years and years to build this massive tomb? To build a massive tomb and temple for one person 
who was at the top of their hierarchy. What happened in ancient Egyptian culture that caused them to be so intent on making this a reality? That that was the reality that they lived in. We still have the results of this work done by ancient people, and we don't really know the details, right? We don't have the stories of the thousands of people who worked on them or the details of how this was put together. We just have this monument in front of us. We don't have a complete picture of how it got here, even if we accept it wasn't put there by aliens. Our text in Acts raises some similar questions about the hows and whys of the early church. This passage is kind of a sidebar, really, explaining amidst all the antics in the early church what was happening with the whole community. And we see something quite amazing here, that they are living completely in common without claiming ownership over anything. The disciples are testifying to what they have witnessed, and there's this grace over the whole community such that no one has need. And for some context, we're not talking about a small number of people here. This came up as a question during our Bible study this week. How many people are we talking about? This isn't just the 12 disciples and some others who are hanging on after Jesus' death. Acts mentions that 50 days after the Passover, so just 50 days after the Last Supper and Jesus' crucifixion, the Holy Spirit is unleashed in a moment that we refer to as the Pentecost, and 3,000 new people become disciples of the now risen Christ. And these 3,000 people, according to Acts, are from all over the world, and many are speaking different languages from one another. So now this hodgepodge group of people blend with the group of people who had already been following Jesus, and this is their response to the risen Christ. They live together. People from all different backgrounds, with different languages, they distribute to any who are in need, and they begin to figure out what it means to have unity amidst their differences. How did that happen? How did they decide to do that? This is a miraculous moment. Think about this for a bit, about what this would entail for you and your family members to give up ownership over all of your possessions and your financial stability, your home and your way of life, to live in a community with maybe a few thousand other people, right? Trusting that your needs would be met, that you'd get enough to eat, that you'd have a roof over your head, that in this group you'd find meaningful work. That would be tough, right? There's a reason that why living in intentional communities is often considered a bit fringe. Yeah, so forming a community like this, it's fragile, it's difficult, it's a leap of faith, it's scary, right? There are any number of of ways that this could go wrong. Imagine for a moment if I suggested that members of the church sell their property to pool the money to buy a compound together right? Picture that. I'm seeing some laughter, right? Like, I'm picturing someone at the executive council saying, you know, Chris has just been here a few weeks. Is there a return policy on this guy? Like, we can, we can tell him no. Like, we're gonna, we'll go with the next candidate. Somebody's still out there, right? You'd almost certainly think that I was planning on becoming some kind of cult leader if I suggested this. So how did this happen? How did the early church move so quickly from being a small group of disciples in hiding, right, to thousands of people living in community? It's like questions about how the ancient Egyptians made the pyramids. We weren't sure, we weren't there, but we see the results of it. And we're still witnessing those results thousands of years later. I think of this as the second Easter miracle. The forming of this common community of so many people, many of whom don't even speak the same native language. Is that any less a miracle than Jesus rising from the dead? There was something miraculous there in how this all came together, in the way that they responded to being present with the risen Christ, whatever that looked like in the way that they moved from being 
focused on Jesus leading them, on Jesus' leadership, to being focused on caring for the needs of those around them. That must have been a transformative experience because they were so profoundly changed by it. Like the, buildings of the, like the building of the pyramids, Jesus' resurrection is something that catches our imagination. Something that we look to explain, that we don't have a complete story of. The details escape us. In the Easter narrative, we have multiple Gospels saying different things about Jesus' resurrection. We have a Jesus who is flesh and blood in one description, and then in others he's disappearing and reappearing in front of people like a ghost. We don't quite know what happened, and we can't explain how it happened. And if you're feeling a little fuzzy about it, don't feel too bad because the gospel writers couldn't explain it either. The gospel of Mark, the original version, just ends with an empty tomb. Perhaps it was easier than writing down all the various accounts of the conversation with the risen Christ and what that might have looked like. We don't get to be witnesses to any of that. But we do have this miracle of what comes next. That the people who have come face to face with Christ in the resurrection, they do this amazing thing. They change their lives. They change how they live. And something about the resurrection inspires them to unity and connection and grace. And in part because of how they live, how they love, how they care for one another, Faith in the risen Christ spreads and is passed from person to person. And this movement leaves the area where it was started from the disciples who remained after Jesus' death to be embraced in, in pockets by people of this whole area of the world. People who weren't there to see Jesus in the flesh and blood. People who didn't hear Jesus preaching people who got the message in their own languages from people who were part of this community. We're now in this season of Easter, and perhaps you're wondering, what do we do with the resurrection now? Even coming to church for Easter and having faith in the new life, an empty tomb, it might feel much like the pyramids, something that's big and that happened in the past, and we don't know exactly what to do with it. And we couldn't recreate it if we wanted to. But we know that the what the first followers of Jesus did with this moment. They responded by caring for one another. For living as if unity and connections were the things that were most important in life. They reached out to those around them to seek what was important together. And they did this knowing that in some way God's love and care was present for them. God's love is made known in the resurrection, and we may not have seen that moment, but we see fruits of it all around us. If we have faith, then we are called to find that and live into it. Whatever the details are, that this is the reality of the resurrection. God is there whenever we are called together in love. Let us find ways, let us continue to find ways to put that into practice to live into it. This is what happens when we come together as the church to respond to our faith in ways that the disciples did, to live it out, to love one another, to feed one another, to make sure that no one goes without, to welcome the stranger. When we do this, we'll see the resurrection together. Amen. come now to our time of prayer, the prayers of the people. We'll share our joys and concerns with one another. What are our joys and our concerns this morning that we wish to lift up to God? And I'll come around uh, and hear your, uh, your prayer request, and then we'll pray on that together. Uh, and then I'll return and, and close us in prayer. What are our joys and concerns on this morning?
for peace in Gaza. Yes, for peace in Gaza and Israel. Gracious, loving God, we ask for peace in Gaza and Israel. We ask for your care and love in return of hostages. We ask for your care and love in rebuilding. We ask for your grace and peace to be on this whole situation. So prayers of, of joy that Carol's great uh, nephew was born on Easter morning uh, and that uh, and that your sorry, sister was able to hold him. Gracious, loving God, we pray with uh, joy for Carol's uh, grandnephew who was just born, for her sister being able to hold him in her arms, and for the joy of new life. May that birth bring new life in many ways in, in Carol's family. for your sister, for Carol's sister. God, we lift up Carol's sister who went back into the hospital on, on Tuesday and we know that her time is coming to an end. We ask that you are with her on that journey, that you bring love and, and peace in her heart and in the heart of Carol and in their family. Be with her on this day. We have other prayer requests. Prayers for Joanne's friend Sue, who lost her mother this week. God, we raise Sue up to you, knowing that you are holding her, her mother in your kind and gentle arms. Be with them in this time of loss. There are other joys or concerns this morning? Let us pray. Holy loving God, we thank you for this day, for this time to come together. We ask that you would be present with us, that your spirit would be present and made known, and that this community would come together in one spirit, heart, and mind for the work that you call us to. God, we thank you for the ways that your spirit reaches out through the world and the ways that we care for one another. We thank you on this morning for all of the ways that we are able to care for each other and care for the community, for the work that we do through, through our outreach and mission, through the, the money that was raised for Bread of Life, yesterday for birthday boxes and for outreach to those who are homeless and in need. God, we thank you for these ways and ask that you would build, build us up, build us up in spirit and community so that we could serve more, so that we could welcome in all people as your children. God, we pray for your children around the world for everyone who is living, living under the, the threat, for those who are in hiding, for those who are mourning, for those who are suffering. In Gaza and Israel and Ukraine, and all places where there is violence and threat of violence, we know that you are the 
you are the God of peace. We ask for your peace to reign. And God, we pray for all of those who have needs, all of those who are mourning the, the death of loved ones, those who are those who are in hospice and on this final journey to moving towards you. And all of those who are figuring out this, this moment where death feels abundant in a time that we celebrate resurrection and grace. God, we ask for your resurrection to be made known in so many ways. And God, as we, as we move together as a people, we ask that we would feel your presence and your love. We ask that you would, would hear all of those things that are on our hearts, our prayers, our joys, and our concerns, all of those things that feel too big or too small to lift up in this space. We know you hear those prayers as well, and we lift them up to you. We pray this in the name of Christ, knowing that you are present with us on this day. Amen. During this time, I'd invite us to give of our offering. The offering that we receive goes to support the work of this church and all of the ways that we support our community and one another. Uh, I'd remind you that there, uh, there are many ways of donate, donating, uh, including using the QR code that's in the bulletin. Uh, and uh, you can also give to the offering plates at any time during the service or as you leave today. Let us bless the offering together. Loving God, just as you multiplied the work of the disciples in the light of the resurrection, we ask that you might turn these humble offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness and your love. We lay our efforts, our talents, and our resources at your feet, O God knowing that you will use us to proclaim and embody the good news. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved, we come together to celebrate communion. On this table is a meal that has been prepared for us, amen, that has been prepared for us by Christ, who invites us to this table. Christ who welcomes us into connection and community, whether we, wherever we have come from and wherever we are on life's journey. This meal, which was served to the disciples, has been handed down through the generations and is a sure sign of Christ's abundant promise that God is present with us today, active, alive, and working in our world. At that meal, Jesus gathered them together, and he took the bread, 
to serve it to them. He broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat this bread, remember me. After they had eaten together, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is Christ's life blood poured out for each of us. Amen. Every time you share this meal and take the cup, Jesus invites us to remember me. Let us pray together. Holy God, may your spirit be poured upon this bread and this cup, that in this meal we might find deeper connection with you. As we share this meal with one another, with our forebears, with the disciples, and with Christ, may we bring ourselves to this table to be present to your grace and witnesses to your love. Amen. 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 Friends, come forward to receive the bread and the cup. We, take, we receive the, the bread uh, and the cup and take it back to our seats, uh, and we will all eat together as one. Uh, there is a gluten-free option here on the right if you so choose. Friends, come, for all is ready. bread of life and the cup of grace. This is the bread of life and the cup of grace. The bread of life This is the bread of life and the cup of grace.
Friends, this is the bread of life. Take and eat. This is the cup of grace. Let us drink together. Let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. God of all goodness, we give you thanks for the life that this communion calls us to. We are grateful for the gift of food and the opportunity we have to feed others, the blessing of shelter and the challenge before us to provide for those who are poor, the love of friends and family and your call to love those who are lost and alone the fellowship of the church, and the presence of Christ's welcoming among us. You have given us much. Help us to accept your blessing and your challenges with gratitude and to see your grace for us and for the world. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn is number 575. Would you please rise in body or spirit? Oh, it's time for the benediction. So if you uh, said amen because you uh, filled out your card during the service, come on up. Come on up. You can join me. Help me do the benediction here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow, there's a few. Okay, nice. All right. Excellent. I want now benediction is a word that, uh, that means good words. Okay, so first, I want to say thank you for the good words of saying amen during the service and having everybody say amen back. So I want to thank you for interrupting me during the service. Probably the only time I'm going to say that. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, so, uh, so thank you. So, uh, friends, go now in peace. Go now together. Go now in unity. Find God's love and resurrection all around you in many ways. Look for the ways that we are building that together. And now, uh, as we go now in peace, we're all going to shout a good word. This, this group is going to shout it, and then I want you to shout it back. So, say amen, okay? All right, ready? One, two, three. Amen! Amen! amen.
Amen, friends. Go now in peace. Our parting song is number 238, verse 1.